The theme of today's episode of Tactical Tuesday is going to be overbetting the river for value. So going for the max with an overbet when you have a very strong hand. And if you haven't watched the video on the CPG YouTube channel about the three most important strategies that you should learn in order to be a crusher in poker, you know, maxing your value is one of those strategies. And so it, it may not be the sexiest theme where you're running a gigantic bluff or making a hero call in the river with one pair, but maximizing your value is going to make more of an impact to your win rate than anything else that you can do. And so with that said, let's dive into today's Tactical Tuesday that is all about maxing up value. And do not forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Welcome to this week's Tactical Tuesday where we're gonna be doing some overbetting. We're gonna have good hands. So hooray, we, we make good hands and we decide to overbet. As always, joined by my co-host, Mr. Jonathan Chai. How you doing, sir? Doing good. I'm finally excited to have a, a value hand on the river. I feel like these are these are rare Tactical Tuesday episodes for us. Usually we're trying to figure out whether we can bluff catch with like basically nothing or whether we can jam with basically nothing. Um, so yeah, like you, I'm excited to finally make some make some strong value. All right. Well, you know, it's the hardest hand category to make strong value. It's, e it's easy it's to make nothing. It's, it's really, true. really easy to make nothing. It's fairly easy to make a pair, um, but making a really strong hand, that's a rare thing indeed. So we're going to start out with an open from the button with a hand that makes strong hands, nine, 10 of hearts. We get three bet from the small blind. Looks like we start the hand about 200 big blinds deep. So we have 2K-ish in front of us. Our opponent also has 2K. We get a good flop. Ace of clubs, eight of diamonds, seven of hearts. So we have, once again, an up and down straight draw <laughs> to the nuts, as well as a backdoor flush draw. So villain bets a third. I expect villain to be betting at relatively high clip on this ace high board and small size also makes sense. I don't, I actually, maybe we can make an argument for raising here. I think raising is not the craziest thing. I think calling is reasonable, but raising is also on the table. I do raise here um, because I think a big part of it is like you mentioned, we start the hand 200 big wines effective. And I think that when we do, when we are that deep, um, I want to start having some raises on this flop texture where it's like, I need to assist this player a little bit in terms of getting all the money in. Um, at 100 big blinds effective, I think you can just play a strategy that has no raises here and still get all the money in very, very easily, um, you know, with your strong hands, pocket eights, pocket sevens, ace eight suited, ace seven suited, eight seven. Um, but especially when the small blind starts out with a really small C bet with the range one third size. Um, I'm a little concerned that, hey, like some of my value would want to, um, you know, help this guy along a little bit, like I said, to to make sure all the money goes in at some point and um, not end up with some really, really high SPR on the turn or the river that uh, makes it a little bit more clunky to try to get stacks in. And if I am going to have a value raising range here, 10-9, open ender, an up, sorry, not open ender, an up and down straight draw with a, with a backdoor flush draw, the seven of hearts on board, definitely seems like it should be one of my first bluff raise candidate, so I actually do raise this uh, flopsy bit. Yeah, I think like the combos that just jump off the page are, you know, jack nine, jack ten, nine ten, six five, um, all those with with and maybe even without a uh, backdoor flush draw seem to be great candidates, especially at this depth, as you said. Hard for villain to find a ton of bet three bets here um on the flop and hard for them to do it with in in a way that that's you know has balance where they have lower equity hands in their bet three bet range as well so at this depth you know it, at at a shallower depth villain can bet three bet and you know with hand like maybe ace king um and make our lives pretty difficult but in this case gonna be quite difficult for them and you know un unlike you i i would say on the flop, I'm thinking, okay, so like I can realize some fold equity. I have a chance to make a very strong hand if villain calls, and I can potentially check back the turn 
um, depending on what the turn card is and if it makes sense, right? Like on a turn ace, I'm probably checking behind and I get a chance to like over-realize my equity. Um, a turn eight, a turn seven, like a board pair, I'm probably checking behind. Um, and maybe even uh, a heart I might check behind too. When we we turn a bunch of equity and we don't want to get check jammed on. Um, so like I have options after raising the flop and I'm not necessarily just looking to like, oh, I get to play for all the money. Well, maybe I do when I want to and maybe I don't when I don't want to. And that is just an, a benefit of raising the flop. So yeah, I like that plan a lot. So you raise to 283. Uh, villain calls. Now there is 817 in the pot. The turn is a queen of spades. So full rainbow board now. Ace, eight, seven, queen. There's 817. SPR is around two. And this is actually, you know, one of those situations that I was talking about where villain checks. And now it's like, okay, like, do we bet 600? If we bet 600, like, I think villain's going to be check jamming when they continue, like at a decent clip. Um, we do have like a lot of straight draws um, that raise a flop, and so yeah, like considering the theme of this episode and what the depth looks like right now, I, I think it's pretty clear that you're going to be checking behind. But yeah, like on the flop, I, I think that my plan would be to do a lot of checking, a fair amount of checking, um, if villain does continue after they go ahead and and place that small flop C bet. So yeah, I agree with all that. The only thing that I want to add is that like once villain does call the pretty chunky flop raise, like we've eliminated a lot of the hands that we, you know, we've like, I, we've narrowed them down to some pretty strong hands. Yeah. I think where like, we probably don't have a ton of fold equity on the turn, um, which would be really nice when we have some value, but given a hand like this, I think you're right that like, we probably don't have a lot of fold equity. We definitely don't want to get check jammed on. Um, and so we get to just realize eight outs worth of, clean equity for free just by checking back the turn. And that's what I decided to do. Yeah. And we also block, you know, hands that we would like villain to have, right? Like we, we have a nine and a 10 ourselves. So it's less likely they have nine, 10 suited, uh, less likely they have Jack 10, Jack 10 actually turns kind of a sneaky double gut shot here. Um, so yeah, like you check rivers, the six of hearts. That would be a gin card. Hallelujah. Opponent checks. There's 817 in the pot. I don't need to really ask what you do because of the theme, but oh, looks like we didn't bet all in. You you ended up leaving a few hundred dollars behind. So you went 1.5x pot. I guess let's let's talk about sizing selection here. Yeah, I actually didn't remember that I did this. Um, I thought I was just going to jam the river. Um, I don't know. I think like one of the things that I was hoping here is that like villain finds maybe a few more bluff catches on the river, maybe like just widens their bluff catching range to include some hands that wouldn't call jam. It looks a little suspicious. I'm hoping where it's just like, man, wouldn't you just like jam your value and like, you know, this size might look like you're trying to just save 33 big blinds instead of uh, losing that when you, you know, the times where you do get called. Um, so yeah, I'm just hoping to target like a wider bluff catching range anytime I do this. This is like a pretty rare um it's going to be like a pretty rare bet size for me where I leave a, a few few big blinds behind. Um, but assuming that the villain, you know, assuming villain can just call with like all their ASEX on the flop, which they have a ton of when they threw that small blind versus button. Um, yeah, I think this size hopefully just gets them to call with almost all of them and maybe even wider than that. Like they have a hand like, I don't know, eight nine suited, 10, eight suited, something like that. Um, yeah, so that's my... And the over the overbet itself, outside of you know leaving leaving some big blinds behind, why why the overbet instead of seventy five percent or half pot? Yeah, I think that like again, like once villain calls the raise on the flop, they have some pretty strong hands, and then when they elect to like not jam the river after it goes check check on the turn, it probably like narrows down that range a little bit more, right? So they have like a hand that was strong enough to call the flop, but not strong enough to jam the river. So probably not ace queen, probably not you know a trap like a seven or ace eight or pocket sevens or pocket eights or that type of range. Um, yeah. So I think that that's like, that would, that's the reason I'm going over bet, but not over at jam. Okay. I can dig this it. This hand surprised me a lot and makes me really happy that I didn't jam the river. I think, I don't know what they do with this hand facing jam on the river, but this is not one of the hands that I expected to get. 
yeah, snapped they, off on the flop by. So they call the river with King Queen of Hearts, which is a turned second pair. I will say though, like I mean, with your river size, you are obviously polarized and repping like two pair plus. So then having King Queen maybe not as crazy a, as a bluff catcher as like Ace Deuce. The fact that King Queen called your flop raise, um, pretty pretty questionable. Um, and then after that, though, I think the river, a queen is basically the same as an ace. Uh, so I guess a queen does, does not block their, their, your, your natural two pairs that raise the flop ace eight or ace seven, those types of hands. So like that, that's one way that, you know, an ace could be a better bluff catcher than a queen, but yeah, like, well, who knows? You may have just cost yourself, you know, 34 big blinds if they snapped with king queen here maybe they just snap with everything um yeah that's that's the, that's always like the the thing that gnaws at me after like picking this size and getting called is like you just never know whether you left the yeah. 30 the three big blinds on or sorry the 30 big blinds on the table or not um but i don't know when i see king queen um it feels a little bit better than when i see like you know ace jack or ace king or something like that um, yeah but i'm hoping this guy sort of leveled himself a little bit extra to find the call with second pair. All right. Well, we'll never know, but we can we can hope. So hand number two, you open the button to $30 with an ace of clubs, 10 of diamonds, small blind calls. Guessing small blind is a white belt, considering they flatted. Small blind is, I don't even know if white belt is the right term. He is a whale, just definitely a whale. Um, and that's going to actually set up a lot of the strategy for this entire hand um, where I had seen this player call a jam on the river with third pair. He had king seven and called with a seven on the river. Um, pretty sure that's how he got up to the stack that he had has right now. I think he actually had like 200 big blinds, but, you know, lost a, you know, lost 40 big blinds whaling it off somewhere else. So I had some pretty good info on this guy that he was just not not a big folder on really at least the river don't know what is how tight he's going to play on the flop in the turn um but it just felt like man if this guy gets to the river with one pair he's not the type of player that i want to try bluffing okay which means you better make a hand so flop was queen jack three you have a gut shot to a broadway they check you bet a third they call turn is as Larry David might say, pretty, pretty, pretty good. The king of diamonds. So you turn the nuts. They check. There's 114 in the pot. So this is where, yeah, this is where I start kind of taking that like river, like that hand that I'd seen into, into uh, try to start applying it to my strategy a little bit where like my goal here was just to like try to get this guy to the river as frequently as possible with as wide a range as possible and just hope that for some reason he just is never going to fold a pair on the river so like I just want him to get to the river with 3x pocket 4s pocket 5s 6s 7s 8s like all these hands that I don't know whether he calls on the like I don't again like I don't know what his flop and turn strategy is maybe you can just comfortably bet big on the turn and saying like yeah this guy you know he's gonna you know if he if he plays really loose on the river, maybe he plays really loose on the earlier streets as well. But the only thing that I am really confident of is that like if I can get this guy to the river, I doesn't really matter what the SPR is. So I don't mind having a really, really huge SPR, leaving a really huge SPR here on the turn. Um so I actually bet really small here on the on the turn, just trying to get this guy. Trying to get them to the river. Yeah, Help making sure you, you bet a third on King Queen Jack three. Fill in calls. You get you get the green light to do whatever you want with a five of spades. So final board is king, queen, jack, five, three, no flush available. You have the nuts. Mr. Weak, super weak, white belt checks. And we we go over bets and you you bust out the nuclear option here of, I don't even know what this is, 10x, 10x all in. On the river? I think this is the biggest bet I've made in relation to the pot in my entire life. I <laughs> don't think I've made a, a close to a 10x river bet ever. Um, but if any spot seems appropriate for it, it definitely felt like this one. 
Yeah. So, and you know, I just want to say before we we go to the results and the conclusion of this hand, that you you've essentially taken an in-game meta data point, and that's the one that you're prioritizing when determining your river size based on some past action of your opponent, right? And yeah, I just think that's really important to um, highlight just because these opportunities will present themselves. Um, I'm not going to say regularly, but somewhat often, right? Not Maybe not to this extreme, but in most of your sessions, I, I think that you play, you're able to see some sort of metadata point that you can prioritize over what you normally do. Um, and it's a really good, it's good to do that. And, and so like paying attention here, being aware of like the hands that go to showdown, um, even in pots that you're not in, and then trying your best to map out internally what villain strategy is and what they're doing and how they're thinking. Um, and then doing whatever you can to counter their strategy as hard as possible is just, you know, one of the most important elements of playing strong poker and maximizing your earn rate at the table. Um, or in some cases, you know, avoiding disaster where you may have a hand that's a perfect bluff catcher, but you've been paying attention to a villain and they're just not bluffing often enough. Um, or maybe they have like a, a value size instead of a bluff size and they're, they're splitting sizes. Um, so anyway, just like, Kudos to you for prioritizing the metadata point in this spot and just really going for the max here because it would be very, very, very easy to either place too big of a bet on the turn that may fold out Villain or place way too small of a bet on the river that lets Villain off the hook um, and you're not able to maximize. I'm assuming Villain calls because if Villain folds, I would look pretty dumb after going through that whole thing. Um, yeah, does call. Yeah, but Villain does call. So... Yeah, for the listener at home, I, I just think that's something that you should really, really consider uh, before choosing a size or choosing a line, choosing an action, choosing a way to play your value, your bluffs or your bluff catchers. Those those metadata points, they really, really matter. Um, and yeah, if you enjoy that kind of thing and this kind of strategy discussion, like, subscribe, comment on YouTube or wherever you're consuming this podcast. Fill in calls. What the heck do they have? They have second pair with top kicker. They have ace queen. Um, do you remember if they tanked before calling or if they just? No, this was a really, really, really fast river call. I mean, he just plays fast on every street, uh, and, and you know, he called fast with the seven, which, like, I think that that's also. I mean, that's also something to worth that's worth paying attention to, right? You talked about paying attention to showdowns, but like when he snaps the river for all in with third pair with king seven. I think that just like makes it like very, very obvious that he's just, you know, he didn't even consider folding yeah. at, you know, at any point on the river. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's also like a big part of what gave me confidence to like take this really weird small turn size. And then this really, really weird large river size versus this guy. Cause like, you know, this guy's just not going to think about it with a three or a river five or, you know, like second pair here, um, regardless of how big the, the river bet ends up being. Um, so yeah, just more reason to, to pay close attention to hands that you're not involved in. Perfect. Well done. Great show. I don't have anything left. See you next week. See you next week. Don't miss out on our next great poker adventure. Hit that subscribe button and join the CPG family. This is Tactical Tuesday on Chasing Poker Greatness with your hosts, Brad Wilson and John Chai. Coach Brad approved. Are you a lone wolf searching for the ultimate pack? The CPG Wolf Program is a close-knit brotherhood hell-bent on one thing only, chasing poker greatness. Powered by Bleeding Edge Wolf Strats and led by Coach Brad and his lieutenants, CPG Wolves are systematically prepared for almost any spot they'll encounter on the green felt. If you want to plug into an elite team and have a step-by-step -step game plan to realize your full poker potential, you can apply at cpgwolves.com. Space is limited, and the pack is only as strong as its weakest member. So only the hungriest, grittiest, and most driven will be accepted into the program. Applications are open.
at cpgwolves.com.